And it, that's not to imply that Bigfoot's an animal. That's just to say that this man knows what he's doing. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to him. So here's Dr. Sammy Webster Tell. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Hope you can hear me okay. <clears throat> well, those of you that caught my talk last year, I've got a, a somewhat expanded, slow, I'm going to slow it down and expand on what we talked about last year, and I've got a few new things. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you uh, my history in this endeavor, and... Uh, it's a three-step period. Uh, now, and I'm going to tell you, originally, I thought of myself as the Rodney Dangerfield of Bigfoot. I don't get no respect. And then later on, I discovered I was the Forrest Gump of Bigfoot. I just happened to be in the right time to meet all these superstars. And now, I'm the Sergeant Schultz of Bigfoot. You know who, what that means? I see nothing, I hear nothing, I know nothing. So anyway, those will be my themes as we go through, but <clears throat> it all began with the Patterson video. I was about 11 years old, and I dashed down to the, to the newsstand to get my copy of Argosy, totally freaked out, and just looked at what then we didn't know was a female that was Patty, and I just would look at this and of course, we thought, I thought it was an N of one. I thought that this, uh, this is the only one of these creatures around. <clears throat> but then when I was in high school, Charles B. Pierce produced The Legend of Boggy Creek. How many of you have seen The Legend of Boggy Creek? And so that's Falk, Arkansas. That's right up the road from my hometown. So naturally, we loaded up a bunch of boys in the pickup truck and went to Falk and just about got our butts whipped. And uh, we came back with more boys. Uh, so the issue wasn't the Bigfoot, but was how to get around the local yokels. But at some point, they woke up and they said, we need to quit running these goat-smelling guys off of here, and we need to build a burger bar, a Monster Mart. And that is the Monster Mart in Falk. So we came up there in high school and early college, and I have been run out of the woods in Falk. Uh, my fraternity brother and I were there with our hunting dogs just getting the camp set up and we had asked we said where's the latest activity and, and some lady at the store says go down there by Willie Smith's bean patch and turn left and so we were camping out down at the end of this road where they said to go and all of a sudden the dogs just got tremendously afraid ran hit under my Toyota Land Cruiser and we started hearing all this tremendous ruckus and limbs breaking and grunting and snorting and not, not far at all down the woods. It was, it was very, very impressive. And we just packed up and we went back to Louisiana. <laughs> and I thought it was a hoax. I thought, I thought, oh, they set us up. The locals did it again. They sent us out there to Willie Smith's, you know, bean patch, and they were ready there to, to prank us. And Tommy said, no. He said, Webb, you know, dogs wouldn't be scared of human beings. Those dogs were palpably afraid of something and hiding, uh, these were good hunting dogs, hiding under the Land Cruiser. So that was my second uh, experience. <clears throat> and I'm a coon hunter from way back. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of time in the woods at night uh, chasing after the wily Procyon Loter. And uh, my first encounter that I didn't know with wood knocking happened at, at Lake Bissono. And we were, a lot of the times the stuff that happens to me happens when I'm lost in the woods. And we were lost and again, the dogs came unglued about, we, we had to camp out on this little, this little knoll because it was very, it was during the flood season and the whole place was flooded. And, and about four o'clock in the morning, the dogs came unglued and started wrapping themselves around the tree, growling and, not wanting any part of whatever it was, and it was circling us, and we could hear it walking in the water. And it was going, talk, 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 talk. And we, I, hadn't, I didn't know about wood knocks then, and we couldn't figure out what it was, but this happened for about 30 minutes, and we walked out in the next morning, and we just cataloged it, talked about it amongst ourselves, and then years later, I heard about wood knocking. 
And that's exactly what it was at Lake Bissono. So at some point, I went to graduate school. I'll spare you my vocational aberrations before that. But I ended up at Vanderbilt to do my master's and my doctorate. And the coolest guys on campus were the neuroscience animal behavior guys. Uh, they had this place down below Hobbs Developmental Laboratory, and they chopped up brains, and they explored the vulmeronasal. And uh, Do you all know what the vulmeronasal organ is? <clears throat> when you see your stallion curling up his lip like that, he is, he is activating his vulmeronasal organ. And these guys were studying the brain relationship between that and mating behaviors. And it was pretty obscure. And Dr. Powers used to say, we learn more and more about less and less until finally we know nothing at all. <laughs> and that's the way I feel about Bigfoot. So ethology took over comparative psychology. Comparative psychology says, which is smarter, a crow or a chimp? Who has the higher IQ, a dolphin or a gorilla? You know? And then along came these guys, and they said, you know, things adapt to their natural environment. You know, and, and you know, a squirrel, you can give a squirrel a cognitive problem where you put the food bowl right here and wrap the squirrel on a long leash where it can almost reach the food bowl. A squirrel every single time will go right back around the stake, get enough slack on the line to get the food. A dog will just sit there and pull, pull, pull. Now you might be able to train your border collie to go away and do it, but it's, it's a natural ecological uh, cognition that happens with squirrels because they have to be able to go, they can't reach the nut they want here, so they got to go down the tree, go away from the target, come over and go back up the target. So that's what Conrad Lorenz <coughs> brought to us. Now here's what I want to tell you, those of you, how many of you know who Dr. Melba Ketchum is? All right, so Dr. Ketchum is a veterinarian and she's a, a very fine forensic scientist who had been doing court testimony on DNA all over the land, but she's a DVM. This guy, Dr. Lorenz, was an MD, and over in Europe, it's, you really want to be a PhD more than an MD. Freud wished that he'd been a PhD, and Lorenz was the same way. So he didn't want to practice medicine, he wanted to do basic science. So if you haven't, if you haven't been made aware of the difference between basic science and applied science, this is the way to understand what happened to Dr. Ketchum. She was in the wrong country club. When, when I was at Vanderbilt, if you were an applied, they say, you're gonna be basic or applied? And they go, I don't know, is this a trick question? And it is a trick question, because if you want to be an applied scientist, the guy that, did, that taught us how to do court testimony, they put his office down by the men's room, and he had to listen to the toilet flush all day. But if you were on grant money, and you were studying the vulmeronasal organ, you got the, you know, whatever you wanted. <clears throat> so that's what happened to Dr. Ketchum. She tried to publish. Uh, I was not on the inner circle at that time. Nobody trusted me. That's my Rodney Dangerfield aspect. Nobody trusted me enough. And I, I contacted her. I said, I've got a journal for you to publish in. And she said, oh, well, <clears throat> I've, I've already got the journal. Well, it was Nature. Now, those are the nature and science are the two premier journals of the world. They're not going to take the first Bigfoot story. They're just not. Here he is with his baby geese. Um, so the zoologist said, you know, she's not a zoologist. She's a veterinarian, you know. And so that's what happened to her. She didn't have the right country club card credentials. Now, it's not quite that simple because, as you see, Conrad Lorenz, got publications, and he, but he was the father of the field. <laughs> he invented ethology, which is the wiser version of, of how you study animal behavior. Here's one of my heroes, Dr. Peter Marler. I read everything that he published in graduate school, and he is an expert on the development of songbirds. And my wife said, what is that bird smoking? <laughs> well, I think that uh, this is uh, him trying to study the wavelengths or whatever. And here's my other hero. Did you ever see the movie Never Cry Wolf, where the guy is eating the, 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 the field mice and the Native American chief says, good idea, good idea? But anyway, so this loosely based on, on David Meck, who uh, I think the wolves in Minnesota were the ones he was mostly in, but, but he has done a lot. I'm not sure if he's still alive or not, but these guys are my heroes in ethology. <clears throat> now, 
the way this whole thing started, I was the Igor of the neuroscience lab. I was the guy down in the basement who would feed the rats and bump them off and, and collect the data. And, uh, and we would have lab meetings. We, we would go have Dos Equis. We'd go over to the, the little local Mexican restaurant place there and drink Dos Equis and talk about what we wanted to do next. And this was a very interesting lab at Vanderbilt. Uh, I, I don't have enough time to tell you all the stuff they did, but animal uh, behavior was one of the deals. And we got, we, one night we were talking about um, this howl I'd heard. And so I'm, I'm in Shreveport, Louisiana, and we, we don't have wolves. And so one night I heard this howl that was just so unbelievably awesome. It started way down there. I'm not going to do it for you, but it just went long, long, and loud, and went from the bottom to the top. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. That's Grandpapa Wolf. Who is, what is that? Because the coyotes, I lived out in the country, and the coyotes were around all the time. And I said, man, that's not a coyote. That's one of those, those southern red wolves. And so I was telling Dr. Porter, my mentor, I said, Dick, I have heard a southern red wolf. He goes, Webb, those things are functionally extinct. It's, I mean, you know, I think he, I don't know if he said it might have, it, 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 but at some point, the notion of could it have been a Sasquatch? Now, I'll tell you, in my terminology, in my lexicon, I use the word Bigfoot to mean the whole cultural phenomenon. We're here having a Bigfoot festival. The, the people that live in the woods I refer to in my lexicon as Sasquatch. So that's just the way I differentiate. <clears throat> and that's, that, that has come of late. But that led to talking about Sasquatch. And Dick said to me, Here's the guy who's published more animal behavior stuff than you can shake a stick at. He didn't poo-poo it. He said, that's called cryptozoology. I said, yeah, I've never heard of that. He said, yeah. He said, you know, somebody needs to get in there and, and you know, bring the scientific method to that and see what can be done. And, and so I told him a few of the experiences and studies I'd had, uh, experiences and things I'd heard from people about coon hunting. And that's how it got started. He legitimized that for me. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my credentials. <clears throat> and I put this under credentials because uh, I, I'm not a very good tracker. Um, but, you know, I have been trained officially, and I do try to use what little skills I have. Um, I'm a, I'm a skeptic, and that's, and that's what I want to say to you today. You know, I'm sorry if I'm going to bore you, but I'm going to try to be parsimonious, which means I'm going to try to stick close to my data. That doesn't mean, Dick, Dick Porter used to say, you can hypothesize anything you want to. Be as wild as you want in your, you know, formulating your hypotheses, but be very tight in trying to establish your proof for those hypotheses. So, and that's the way we were in the lab. You could come up with the wildest speculation about what was going on as you wanted to, and it'd be well received. But he was so tight. And that's why when he sent in a paper, you were pretty doggone sure it was going to be accepted. Let's see what I've got here. Okay, so here's my first, here's my first publication. So, you know, the, the way you get into the country club is you get published. And then you're a card-carrying basic scientist. So this is, uh, what we did is we gave zinc sulfate to little Acomus caharinus, spiny mice pups, and made, we, it was a, we were trying to make it a model of developmental delay. And uh, so if you have brothers and sisters, it helps you get resources. If you're a mentally retarded spiny mouse and you've got a brother and sister and you hang with them, they'll take you to where the food is and you benefit. And they'll keep you out of trouble, and they'll show you how to get out of the spot you're in and everything. So we got this published in Physiology and Behavior, and that was my first one. But one night, one night at the old Dos Equis place, they were teasing me about coon hunting, and they said, we got to talk about what make the possum soul. You guys know that story? I think it's Jerry Clower. What make the possum soul? Is that Jerry Clower? Where's my Mississippi guys? Anyway, <clears throat> so we got to talking about possums, and... And it's actually called death fainting behavior. Tonic immobility, death fainting. And we know, now, time out. I want you to put 
hypothetically, ostensibly, purported in front of everything I say, because I'm Sergeant Schultz, I know nothing. <clears throat> so put that caveat in front of everything. And, and you'll see me when I go on TV, I very carefully don't say I believe in Bigfoot. I say I hypothesize that they're out there. So I just want to clear that up. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there is plenty of evidence that Sasquatch engage in ton tonic immobility. They are brilliant, and they know that if they stand still, they look like a bush, you know, and they use that. I mean, and they can, I don't know about you guys, but they can outweigh me. They, I mean, I can go, I think I see you, and they'll stand there or sit there or do whatever they're doing, and, uh, you know, there's a couple of videos on the net where you can see one of them waving a, a fern frond, but that's the only motion he's given. But anyway, tonic immobility and death fainting are slightly different. But you know what your magnum opus is? Your magnum opus is your great work. So this is my magnum opossum. I don't know if you can see it or not. But basically, uh, the best thing that can happen to a guy that's trying to do science is that somebody grab his work and use it. So in 2005, uh, right there, in 2005, Tim Caro, who is the number one predator prey guy in the country, wrote a book stock kind of a tome about predator prey relationships. And he cited Sintel and Compton in there. And I was, you know, my work was resurrected. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's what makes me a basic scientist. I'm going to read this to you now. So, and I told Dr. Ketchum, I said, Dr. Ketchum, and I said, I've got a, a journal that does population biology based on DNA uh, as a holotype. I think you might be. She says, no, we've got a journal. Little did I know it was nature. And, and you all know the whole thing. And I'm going to tell you, Mel Bakesham is, uh, to me, a very brave woman. And she has withstood a lot of pressure to do what she did. So I don't have any faults. With, I, don't, I don't find fault with Mel Bakesham. I wish that she would have trusted me earlier on. And I think I could have guided her to some some more smooth sailing with it. <clears throat> uh, why not Sasquatch? This, this is what I, I tried to get her to send it to the SSE, the Society for Scientific Exploration. Can you all see, is, are you all able to see this well enough? I'm gonna read it. <clears throat> Bigfoot Sasquatch continues to be an area of great interest in our culture. While science steadfastly resists examination of the anecdotal data in any comprehensive way, this paper uses the term Sasquatch to represent the purported biological species and Bigfoot to represent the cultural phenomenon. Bigfoot phenomena are sometimes hoaxed, but hoaxing can, hoaxing can be studied within social psychology. Nevertheless, Bigfoot phenomenon are not all hoaxes. Bigfoot is also an archetype of the human collective unconscious and can be studied within the psychoanalytic neuroethological and phenomenological disciplines. Phenomenological or psychoanalytic research is historically discounted by zoology, which also rejects Sasquatch as a species. Yet Sasquatch is now considered a de facto species by a small but increasing number of scientists. I propose that the problem with Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomena is lack of orthogonality within one discipline. It doesn't stay put. The blurred boundaries between the social psychology of hoaxing and the archetypal and biological areas of inquiry leave scholars feeling vulnerable or confused. As such, academics often refuse to peruse the existing anecdotal data and furthermore make irresponsible public statements that are verifiably false in assessing this area of scientific study. <clears throat> now you understand on the side, this was in the middle of the Erickson project. I had signed a non-disclosure agreement and then I got invited to present this paper in Boulder, Colorado at the, at the society's annual meeting. This paper reviews one such example of a false irresponsible public statement made by a scientist reporting on the status of current research on Sasquatch. This scientist stated unequivocally that no scientist to date has ever discovered scat or hair 
that might be from a Sasquatch. This paper seeks to use this erroneous public statement to reject the implied hypothesis made by a scientist reporting on the status of current research on Sasquatch. This scientist stated unequivocally that no scientist to date has ever discovered scat or hair that might be from a Sasquatch. This paper seeks to use this erroneous public statement to reject the implied hypothesis that no scientist has to date found scat or hair. This writer is one such scientist who has indeed found anomalous scat and hair, as well as other anecdotal evidence supporting the possibility of Sasquatch. This paper presents photographic evidence of possible Sasquatch scat and hair samples to the newly developing Sasquatch DNA database and implications. Additionally, I provide other additional anecdotal photographic evidence in support of the possibility of Sasquatch and discuss discuss other currently promising related research methodologies. And then the last paragraph, the last paragraph of, this is my abstract. Sasquatch, because of their similarities with humans, pose new and novel problems for research methodology and ethics. Sasquatch research may influence humans to consider new approaches in e ethology and ecology. What are our implied human obligations about protection of the niche occupied by this purported species? Can Sasquatch ethically refuse to participate in Sasquatch research? Certainly science needs to reconsider the traditional appropriateness of harvesting a specimen. If they appear to be hominid, of course it's murder, you see. Bigfoot Sasquatch research may ultimately contribute to the shifting of some old paradigms of research, ethics, and the ways of knowing in the academic world. How are we doing? And I'm gonna show you the scat sample. I'm gonna show you the hair sample that became sample 22 in the Ketchum database that went into the Erickson project. I'm gonna show you the tree that uh, we call him Grover. I don't know what his real name is, but uh, the tree that Grover stood behind as he watched us peeling bark and, uh, and finally had to go to the bathroom. And uh, uh, I've got a cave nearby that uh, has two slim 14 and a half uh, inch uh, humanoid prints and, so, and five uh, knuckle prints. What else do I have to show you? So I'm gonna show you that whole stuff that went into the Ketchum project and, um, and offer you some ideas about how we can participate uh, together in some meaningful research that very well might get the attention of the academy. We're, we're just about, anybody have any questions while we're waiting for the, the technology to get back on? Have I seen one? That is a very good question. Not like I want to. Not like I want to. I have seen flashes of brown and red hair that indicated a very large mammal was um, coming by. Or, uh, I've had quite a few flashes. Um, one, one late one afternoon, we were, and of course, uh, uh, I'm in an area, I don't know if you all have ever heard of Chimp Haven, but it's a, it's a huge preserve uh, near Shreveport that was thought to be ideal for chimps. They've never had one escape that we've known of, but guess what? If you had one escape, would you put it on the front page of the paper? Probably not, I don't know. So I'm about three miles from Chimp Haven one day, and I see this small, black, what looks like a chimp, uh, scamper across the road about 80, 85, 90 yards in front of me, just making tracks. I stopped and looked, didn't, didn't really see anything compelling, certainly didn't see 
this uh, mammal again. Um, I, I, one time I was riding, we used to do mules. Uh, I have had several influences in, in this area. And one of my influences said, you have to do it, go to the woods and do interesting things. Don't, don't hunt them, don't chase them, let them find you. So I had these, from coon hunting, I used to ride these Shetland mules, you know, that you call them shed asses, and this kind of fits their personality. So <laughs> that's what they are, shed asses. And, so, and, and you'll see Joyce in, in some of my pictures. So, uh, so basically, uh, we're riding these mules in a real, we go to the hot areas, and I think David on Joyce is right out over there, but actually David on Joyce was right back here. And so at, at my 11 o'clock position, thank you, great, thank you. At my 11 o'clock position, I see something big. Now, uh, in Louisiana, we have people who have discovered that they go on all fours a good bit. And I don't know if that's a regional variation or what. But this looked like Joyce. It looked like the hindquarters of a Shetland mule going around the corner, but it didn't have a tail. And so I don't know what it was. It could have been a hog. It could have been, this is a hog area, and I didn't show pictures of this area, but all kind of wood structures. But I want to have, the way I got to my, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give kudos to Mr. Kawani Lapsaritis there. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow. I, got, I had about 12 areas, I had about 12 areas, and I, had, I just couldn't cover all this ground, and I said, I gotta narrow this down, what am I gonna do? And I don't know where I'd heard, but you know, I'm a, in psychology, you can be, it's a very broad field, and so I knew a little bit about dowsing for water. Have you all ever, you knew anybody can find water with the forked stick? So I said, I wonder if I can find somebody that can do map dowsing, and so I contacted Kawani, and he said, indeed, I can do that. And I sent him about a half a dozen maps. And he sent me back the most amazing information. And the thing that sold it for Kawani with me is he nailed some places I'd already been. The place that I'm going to show you with the nest where I got the video that you're going to see a moving blob squatch. Kawani did not know about that place, but he circled on the map, he said, make your camp here. And that is exactly what you're gonna see in a few minutes where I had already accidentally got a little piece of video. So let's take a look now as we move forward. Okay, so here's the Erickson Conference. And uh, interestingly, I was the only basic scientist there. I'm the only guy at this conference that has uh, published in a, in a referee journal with my publications. But nevertheless, I sat over on the end and uh, I knew those guys were in for a disappointment because they thought game over. They thought we have discovered that Bigfoot is a human hybrid. The world will now give us kudos and it'll all be over. And I, I gently tried to say, guys, We'll be lucky if we're off to a start. I think we got a good start. But so I sat way over on the end, and that's why I'm in the middle answering some questions here. Do you all know these characters? Let's, let's do it this way. All right. So, uh, and this is where I met Troy, by the way. Troy Hudson is right there in the middle. Hold on. Looking with his suit on. There's Troy. And there's Melba, Adrian Erickson, Dennis Fole, and... Uh, uh, Rich Germo. So we had a, had several police people from the police and investigations. Uh, J. C. Johnson is a cryptozoologist. A Adrian Erickson is a financier, and Melba is a, a veterinarian that does forensic stuff for the court. So they didn't realize how hard it was going to be to break into the country club, but but this is my second abstract when I presented in Washington for the Society of Scientific Exploration. And so, um, what, by this time, the, the disclosure agreement's gone, the controversy has pretty much, it's still swirling, but it's not at its peak. Uh, I am thinking the best data we got at this point is that Sasquatch is a human hybrid. In other words, that's what has to be disproven. Before these guys go out and shoot one, they need to disprove what Dr. Ketchum has said, that, that we believe they're human. So I'll read this to you here. 
The hypothesis that Sasquatch is a type of homo sapien has found increasing support in recent years, even in the midst of controversy. Therefore, the old approach of putting them in the crosshairs of a high-powered rifle to secure a holotype increasingly appears to be murderously inappropriate. Some SSE contributors consider Sasquatch a de facto discovery. Now, you all don't know, but Bendernagel published in the, in the SSE one time. But mainstream science continues to deny the species' existence. Ethically-minded researchers are turning to the habituation model as the only viable alternative. Samuel Webb Sintel, PhD, is, probably, is perhaps the only published ethologist currently involved in serious efforts related to Sasquatch habituation. He presented his research, prior research entitled Why Not Sasquatch at the 2012 Bonfire of the Paradox Conference of the SSE. He was limited in 2012 by a non-disclosure agreement and was not permitted to discuss the hypothetical human DNA findings at the time. Dr. Sintel presents new research on making connections with Sasquatch. This current investigation covers not only the traditional ethological approach, but also the Jungian archetypal perspective and the transpersonal perspective on these forest people. Dr. Sintel reports on two habituation sites and present, and those, both of those habituation sites are the direct result of Kwani lapsaritis. <clears throat> and he was right. They turned out to be very, very fruitful although I did not get to see one. And I'm gonna tell you is that the rest of that story in a second. Uh, uh, two habituation sites and presents anomalous aspects of the Sasquatch mystery as it continues to unfold. Sasquatch, although exceptionally furtive by nature, they like to hide, apparently willing to, appear willing to engage on their own terms in making connections with certain safe humans. The subtleties and implications related to the relationship connections seem to go beyond the normative science that we learn in graduate school and enter into the mystical and shamanic realms of the numinous within nature. So um, that's, uh, that's my second presentation with SSE. Now, the way I got to the second place that Kwani says is my best prospect place, um, I'll spare you the, the, the chain of, of custody of this story, but I interviewed this guy who was deer hunting and walked up on a cow carcass that was wiggling. And he said, wow, I didn't know maggots were that vigorous. And he said, like Luke Skywalker, this thing backed out of the hind end of this carcass and stood up. He said it was about eight feet tall, broad shouldered, covered with black hair about four inches long, had, you know, apparently, you know, it was harvesting whatever from this carcass. And he said he looked at my 308, and I looked at him, and he turned and walked up over a little berm and disappeared in the woods. He said, I went home, hung up my 308, and never went back, for my, even for my deer stand. And he would not go with me. His daughter, he and his daughter told me how to get there. Long story short, that's very close to where I'm at. I said, Mr. Brumfield, is it possible that this could have been a man in a monkey suit? And he chuckled. He, and he said, I was about 10 yards from him. I could see the muscles rippling underneath his hair. Mm. Most magnificent specimen I ever saw in my life. And I mean, just totally credible. And that's the kind of encounter I've been needing to have, wanting to have, where I'm looking at him like I'm looking at you, and I can see that you're not a dude in a monkey suit. That's what I'm looking for. I hadn't had that one yet. All right, so. <clears throat> um, I may have to run through this a little quicker because I don't want to run out of time. One of the things that ethologists talk about is mating behaviors. And bowerbirds, they romance their, their girls with blue. They bring them blue, okay? And so I'm going to play this for you. This is one of the more interesting things we have found. trying to opine, uh, let me just pan here. The water's way down there. The water's probably uh, 20 feet below us. It's up an incline. And so this thing is balanced right here. But here's what I want to show you. Look at this thing. This thing right here, it's swinging. Okay, so this thing, see it's not touching the ground, see? Not touching the ground. 
is swinging. And this piece of wood right here is older and it's driftwood and it doesn't go there. And this piece of wood right here is new. This piece of wood is up under here. See, it's balanced like this. It's up under here. And then we got a little crown here. And then this one is hung up. How, how could that, if it fell? If it fell that way, like they were saying, how did this get hung right in there? Well, this is very interesting. So, Okay, so I don't know how many of you are Freudians, but I saw a lot of Freudian phallic sim symbolism in that, that woods structure. So I think it's, you know, I thought maybe a young Sasquatch trying to say, hey, look, look what I got for you. <laughs> here's, here's one of my best tracks. You can see the toes. Uh, you can see clearly the toes. Here's the outline of the foot down in Kasachi. This is a watermelon. I started. I try to do things that that I, I'm not high tech. So I've I've got a FLIR, I've got game cams, I've got the listening device. I take with me almost always, but I, I go low tech. And this is part of what Kiwani and others have encouraged me. You know, you, don't, you if you're going to build a relation, if I'm going to build a relationship with you, I better not put a game cam in your kitchen, had I? Wouldn't that make you mad if I came and you discovered that? It, I, over last night and I put a game cam in your kitchen. So I think it's just sort of bad friendship building and you know I'm not opposed to I'm, you know I'm trying to do it differently. There are a lot of people with game cams and FLIRs out there and I've, I've tried that and every time I took my FLIR to this spot the activity would go away for about two weeks. It's as if they were punishing me by not, not interacting much. This, this melon was taken in total. It was carried off. If it was a, a coyotes are known sometimes to eat watermelons, but why would they carry it off? They'd eat it right there. A hog would eat it right there. Deer, it, who, whoever else would eat it right there. It was carried off. This is the second melon. Now we have our fingernail guy here this morning who has an interesting thing. Look how this melon is carved. Can you see that? It's carved almost like a helmet. And uh, here's another angle. And it looks as if it's carved with maybe, I'm gonna you know, say maybe a large, very hard fingernail. This is the third melon. Now this melon has been chewed on by something else. Uh, you find, and I've heard other people say this too, that, that uh, now again, I think that most of what is fooling with our food plot is a very young one because I've got evidence and I won't go into it that every once in a while Papa comes and tells him, don't mess with those guys, leave them alone. We can hunt for ourselves. We don't need, we don't need Mars bars and what triangle that I left on this melon is, is cut off. What's happening here? All right, you see the triangle? So the triangle is cut off in a sort of a triangle shape. So my experience is these guys are always telling me, yes, we understand. We understand you. We understand what's going on. And, and we can match that. And they're pretty clever. <clears throat> so at some point, the game shifted with me. And they began to, okay, so what I discovered was that they seem to like sweet things. They seem to like homemade things. They don't like processed food. I'll talk about that tomorrow. They don't like apples with, with labels on them. You have to peel the labels off. But all of a sudden, I got the bright idea to put some toy animals out there. And I put this beautiful toy turtle on top of some honey with honeycomb. A guy in East Texas told me, oh, they will take honeycomb. And so they did. They snatched this honeycomb, hauled the whole jar off, and the turtle, okay? And it was on 1221. So I began to get jars opened. And I'm going to talk about that some more tomorrow, so be sure. And then here's the top to the jar. 
And you can see that somebody has made a vertical, again, like a fingernail poke with a very hard fingernail that I didn't make as they were trying to get the top off. Okay, so the turtle disappeared back in December, I think the 21st, and then on 3-1, I'm going to show you the marble game tomorrow. The marble game is, to me, the, the height of this whole interactional thing. On 3-1, somebody brings me back the turtle that's been missing for months and the big blue marble that's been missing for a week. So I'm experimenting with size and color, and these guys are just playing head games with me like crazy, okay? <clears throat> but this was, and this, this was, this blew me away right there. <clears throat> Here's the, the, the food tags. They don't care for, they don't care for tags on their food. And now here's the interesting thing. So a lot of times when I put food out at the food plot, the first set of apples just rotted off the tree. No coon touched it, no possum touched it, nothing touched it. Now I try to, I try to put it in a, in a way so that I can logically rule out, you know, other species. It's hard to do with coons, but, but basically uh, they don't like, and here's the, here's the, here's the processed food. My wife said, well, they were out of homemade fritters at the place where I got the fritters that they, they first started taking the fritters. And she said, just get, just get one of those apple strudel things. And this is one of those highly processed, all the ingredients are listed, you know, the whole chemistry department's on there. And we put it in the same fork in the tree that they've been taking it from. Somebody took one big bite of this apple strudel and threw it down. I came the next day, late morning, and nobody's touched it. The ants are getting at it a little bit, but nobody else touched, you know, Junior's snack, but he didn't want it either. He didn't like it. At any rate, uh, the first time they opened a jar for me was to get the homemade Amish sticky bread. And uh, uh, that's going to pop up in a minute, and I'll, I'll get a chance to talk about that. This, this is my other site, uh, and Ronnie found this. Uh, it was a rock that was, you know, uh, sometimes they appear to leave gifts and things like that. And on this island, there were about eight turtle shells right down the trail where something had been systematically eating turtles. And it looked like the rock was used to, to crack into the turtle shells. 